Hey, welcome back. So today I want to talk about my head uh, because I'm sure that many of you have probably noticed uh, that I have my head shakes. It shakes in a no-no direction. And so I wanted to address that. I've had people ask me, um, actually I've had less people ask me about it and more people just stare when they meet me and they don't know what it is. I've had some people say, do you have Parkinson's disease? And I've had to explain that no, I don't have Parkinson's disease. I have what they call cervical dystonia. Now I'm gonna read what it says for Mayo Clinic just so I don't get it wrong. So cervical dystonia, also called spasmatic torticollis, is a painful condition in which your mu neck muscles contract involuntarily causing your head to twist or turn to one side. Cervical dystonia can also cause your head to uncontrollably tilt forward or backward. Now, sometimes symptoms begin with a shaking the head from side to side as if people are shaking their head to say no, that's what mine does. Some muscles may contract and stay contracted or they may contract intermittently twisting the neck. The condition may be painful. So I have cervical dystonia, cervical meaning the, mus the neck right here, the neck. And um, then dystonia, of course, is the, the shaking, the muscles that are involuntarily shaking. Now, as far as I understand, or involuntary contracting. Now, I'm not an expert on dystonia. I am an expert on my experience with dystonia. But for dystonia, cervical dystonia as a whole, no, I'm not an expert. I see the movement specialist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they have, uh, or have seen them. I think the last time I went in was about a year, a year and a half ago. I had a new primary care doctor and when I get a new primary care doctor, because our, my doctor has left or uh, retired, I usually have an issue because they say, oh my gosh, what, what is going on with your head? Do you have Parkinson's or have you been diagnosed with any one thing? And I always tell them, I have a movement disorder. It's called cervical dystonia and there's nothing that they can do for me. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sure there's something they can do for you. I'm sure there's treatment for this. And I said, there is but I have gone through the treatments that are available at this time and they have not been successful. And the doctor's always like, oh, I think I'm gonna refer you back to Rochester. I'm like, you don't have to refer me, I can just call and go, but go ahead. So I went this last time about a year and a half ago and I saw one of the movement specialists, the doctor who's in a movement specialist, and he smiled and said, we don't have anything that we can get you new. He goes, you had the Botox, for two years, you had the Botox treatment to the muscles in the neck, and it didn't work. I, I, it would start to work really fast, and then it would wear off super fast, and so you only can have it every three months, and mine would start to work within a week and a half, and it would be stop working within three weeks. I would get very little, little, um, what do you call that word? A uh, little help, that's not the word I'm looking for though. I would, a little relief. I would get very little relief from the shots on top of the fact that they were extremely painful. The first treatment they have to go into, they come into the neck with probes and they hook the probes up to a microphone and they stick the probes into your neck and they listen for the loudest muscles and then they map those out to see which ones are the ones that are causing the most issue with the twisting. My head twists, wants to twist to this side. It doesn't want to twist down, it wants to twist up. If I could hold my head, which I can, I don't want to though, the rest of my life I'd be like this, then I have very little, very little tremor. But because I want to have my head straight out, then I'm constantly fighting because I want to go this way and my neck wants to go this way. No, it's kind of crazy, but I got very, very little, little relief from the, from the Botox. One time I had a very hard time swallowing within a few days. I called and they said, okay, tuck your chin in and then swallow and see if that helps, which it did, but it was about a week and a half where I had to keep tucking my chin to swallow and I was scared I was going to choke many, many times. That one scared me because I got too close to the swallowing muscles. Then the tendons, the long bicep tendons in my arm, uh, started to have issues and I couldn't lift my head above my hands above my head and when I would try to run I would get a lot of pain in my arms which sounded kind of weird but it was the bicep muscles were getting um, very not sure exactly but inflamed and so the doctor said I needed to give the Botox treatment two years I said okay it was very expensive even after our insurance covered it it was still seven or eight hundred dollars every time I had it done I said okay we'll give it two years so on the the dose in November, 
of the two year, that would have been the exact two year dose. I um, walked out of my house Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving to go for a walk. I was a little dizzy from the Botox because when the muscles start to go to sleep, my head no longer felt the support it used to have. And so I was quite dizzy and I stepped out of my house. I stepped onto some ice. I couldn't control it with my the dizziness and the ice. And, you know, I may have, I may have fallen anyway, had it not been for the Botox making me more dizzy from the lack of muscle control. And I slipped right down the stairs. Luckily it was only about three or four stairs, but my arm was behind me when I landed and I thought I heard a rip. And so I was like, and I was just sitting there going, oh, 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 oh. And my husband comes out and he's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what hurts, what hurts? And I'm like, everything, <laughs> everything hurts. So, and my arm was still back there because I hadn't brought it forward yet. And so I just sat there going, okay, my butt hurts, my arm hurts, everything hurts. So he helped me up my other, with this arm, my left arm, and he helped me stand up. And I went to the house and I sat down. He said, do you want to go to the emergency room? I said, no, I don't want to. I think, I think it's going to be okay. I think I, I just fell. I'm just a little rattled. It's okay. So I waited and my arm got sore. My butt got sore. My butt was so sore that I thought that was as, as bad as it was. So it eventually, I thought, yeah, it feels better. I went back to work after Thanksgiving break and my arm just, it didn't, it didn't feel better. It didn't get better. So I went into the doctor and they said, oh, you strained it. I said, no, I swear I heard something rip and I hadn't found any holes in my clothes. I said, and it was, you know, it was like right up to my ear when I heard it. And they said, no, 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 no. So Mayo Clinic, like most clinics, has a protocol and you have to go through the protocol. Uh, not personalized in the beginning, you go through the protocol. So I went through the protocol. And so because of physical therapy and uh, they did x-ray you know, no broken bones, physical therapy, which was very painful. And they were like, you know, go and do things you enjoy, which I enjoy cross country skiing. So I went and did that. And I felt like that kind of gave me more motion. I felt like something kind of like loosened up. I was like, oh, that's good. But the physical therapy really hurt. And so eventually a few months later, the doctor said, yeah, let's just do um, an MRI. Did an MRI and I had a torn rotator cuff. They went in for the rotator cuff. Uh, they went in with um, some cortisone and the, and they used the ultrasound to check it and they and that helped for a little while but then they scheduled surgery and they went in and repaired the rotator cuff now when they were in there they said when i woke up they said oh there's a lot of problems inside your shoulder i said what were the problems she said you have a frozen shoulder i said oh she goes why aren't you using your shoulders why aren't you you know are you're not using your shoulders if you've got a frozen shoulder i said she goes from the pain from the rotator cuff you just stopped using it i said no it's the pain in the biceps. I said, I haven't lifted my arms above my head for probably a year. I said, the pains in my bicep tendons is horrible. I said, just going like this, I'm like, ah, that was before I tore my rotator cuff. And so she was like, okay, so your recovery is gonna be totally different um, because of the fact that you had the frozen shoulder and we cleaned it out. Now this shoulder got better with use. So I think this shoulder would have got better with use had I not torn the rotator cuff. But my recovery was pretty, pretty quick. Um, and I, I felt like it went pretty well. But a few months after the surgery, I leaned back. I was on the floor helping my sister pack her apartment. I leaned back and I felt a pop. And then I couldn't move my arm. It scared me to death. <laughs> and I went back to the doctor. They checked everything out. And they said, no, you just, we don't know what happened, but it's okay. Everything's in there. Everything's working. Everything feels fine. You just need to let it, you know, keep healing. So I'm like, okay. But you also have to keep using it so you don't end up with a frozen shoulder again. It's a very interesting experience. It's much better now. And so I don't really have any problems. I can lift my head above my or my arm of my head, which is awesome because before it was like this and then I couldn't reach behind me. Now I can reach almost as far behind me as I can with my left hand. But I really feel now that story, woo, off on a tangent, but honestly it's not a tangent as much as I feel that the dystonia treatment caused a lot of those problems. Uh, the bicep muscles. I did talk to the doctor that I saw a year and a half ago and he said, well, how did the treatments go? Do you want to do them again? I told him, no, this is what happened because you see a different doctor every time you go in for treatments. And I said, this is what happened. He said, oh, that was, they got too close to something or another. I didn't write it down. He's like that. That doesn't always happen. I said, yeah, I just, I don't want to go through that again. And he looked at me and he said, well, you are a special case because you have dystonia, cervical dystonia, but you also have an essential tremor. So the Botox would work on the muscles that were controlling the dystonia tremors, but they weren't working on the muscles that were controlling 
the essential trimmers. And then so they get one set of muscles, they put them to sleep with the Botox, and then the other set of muscles would take over. So it seemed like the, the top of my neck would start to go to sleep, but then my trapezius, which they would also put some Botox in there, would start to take over. And I'd get a lot of pain through the back of my neck and shoulders during that time. A lot of fun. So I just want to explain why my head shakes. I am going to put some information about dystonia in case you're interested, or maybe you have dystonia or you know someone who suffers from dystonia. I can tell you that right now, the worst thing to do, somebody that you see who has well, anything, but is shaking their head is to just stare at them. Oh my gosh. I get so many stares. They just stare at me and I'm like, okay, I know you're thinking, is her head shaking or is her head not shaking? And the truth is, is I'd rather you just ask me. I've had a lot of people who just say, do you have Parkinson's? And I'd rather they ask me that than just continue to stare at me. I, it's not a lot of fun to be stared at. <laughs> I can imagine you probably know that. But as a teacher, I've had um, some of my students who have gotten upset with other students who are new and I had not explained to the new students. I explained to my class at the beginning of semesters that this is what's going on. I'm not disagreeing with everything I'm saying. I'm not telling you no. If I say no, you will know it. And then I'll have a new kid and I will just forget. And he'll go, why do you keep shaking your head at me? What am I doing wrong? And one of the kids in the class will smack him or something and say, hey, she has a disability. Stop talking like that. She has a thing that makes her head shake. It's okay. Don't tease her. And I always appreciate that. My kids always have my back. It was, that's not why I'm leaving teaching for a year. They always had my back. My students were amazing at that. So, but if you have any questions about dystonia, there's a lot of resources on the web. I'll see if I can put any at the show notes, but you can always comment. Um, let me know if you're suffering from this or if you know someone who is, or if you have any ideas that my doctors have not been able to, like I said, protocols. I have heard of some oxygen uh, heavy duty oxygen, um, therapies for people, with dystonia, they're not offered by my doctor. So, and then there's some massage therapies and other things that I've thought maybe I would try, but sometimes I'm like, it's not that bad. I mean, it's painful time. Sometimes I'll turn my head quickly and the muscles will lock up and they'll stay locked up for, it can be hours to days. And I'll just have this knot that makes it very difficult. Uh, but Otherwise, I found it's, I can live with it. It's not a huge deal. I mean, my doctor likes to tell me when I, the movement doctor likes to say, everyone has something. And this is not that bad. I'm like, thank you. I realize everyone has something. And it's not that bad. And it's no reason that I can't live with it. So I'm going to put some notes in if you're interested in any of the, like the Mayo Clinic side on it. Or you can, of course, Google it on your own. Uh, dystonia is not just in the neck. My cervical dystonia is just from the neck. Um, but there's people who have it in their hands and their feet. People with Parkinson's can develop dystonia in other parts of their body, in parts of their bodies, which make people think, oh, that's why you have Parkinson's. Um, people can develop in their voice box. When I was first diagnosed, he had me sing. Um, he wanted to hear it. And I didn't have it in my voice box. He had me walk. I didn't have it in my walk. I didn't have it in my feet or my legs. I didn't have it in my hands. I have an essential tremor in my right arm that he noticed, which I'd known I'd had that since high school. And then the essential tremor in my neck and then the cervical dystonia is only it. I don't have it anywhere else. And that's a blessing not to have it anywhere else because it's enough to have it in my neck. But hey, thanks for stopping by. I hope you have a great day. And remember, like this video or, or like this video if you can and if you liked it. Don't like it if you didn't. And please subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. I did get kind of rambly today and I apologize. I'll try not to ramble as much in the future. But no guarantee. Thanks. Bye.